with a performance of Mr. Estes and our ISU Orchestra choirs with Janet Elkhorn, a soprano soloist, and Mr. Estes um, on the great Brahms German Requiem. So I hope that you also have that on your calendar. That will be a wonderful night for uh, the music department and hope we can share that with you. You probably know a lot about Mr. Estes' career. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have read his autobiography and know many of the chapters of his life. Um, certainly you're aware uh, of his great career in opera. He has sung on virtually all the great opera stages of the world. He has performed with many orchestras all over the world, some of the great conductors of our time. Um, you perhaps don't know as much about Mr. Estes the man, but I can tell you that this is a very great human being with a big heart and a very generous spirit. And our students at Iowa State have benefited from the interaction with this very wonderful man. We are just thrilled to have him here and um, happy to share him with you tonight. Uh, you perhaps know that he's going to be talking about his experiences, particularly in South Africa. Uh, but there will also be time for you to ask questions about other topics if you have other things you'd like to ask him. So please join me in welcoming Simon Estes. Thank you very much, Sue, for that nice introduction. And I'm delighted to be here again and see so many wonderful friends and uh, students and faculty members. The topic that they asked me to speak about was breaking barriers, an American, an African American in South Africa. So I will predominantly talk about that. And as Sue said, you certainly can ask me questions about other areas, including that particular topic, uh, when I finish talking just a little bit about uh, my experiences in South Africa. I went to South Africa for the first time about uh, seven years ago, I believe it was. Yes, 1993, it was right after Nelson Mandela had been elected president of South Africa. I had been asked to go there, I remember, in the mid-70s to perform. And of course, that was still under the apartheid regime. And uh, in those days, I had been singing already maybe about 10 years, but certainly I still didn't have any money. I mention that because they offered me at that time an astronomical amount of money to get me to come. There would be some American singers that would go there and from other countries that would perform, but um, I wouldn't go. And I will tell you, they offered me $30,000 a performance in 1976. And in 1976, $30,000 was worth more than $30,000 today, and that was going to be for six performances. And so obviously they were trying to tempt me uh, with the financial means to come there. But uh, my mother and father always taught me that character and values and principles and integrity are more important than money. So needless to say, I refused to go. But I did make a stipulation to them. I said, I will come if you will guarantee me that more than 50% of the audience will be people of color. If I could have an internationally televised discussion with Mr. Bota, on apartheid and how ridiculous that system is. And of course, they refused my, uh, my uh, stipulation, so therefore I did not go. But I did go there in 1993, and I was the first man of color, needless to say, to ever sing on the stage in Cape Town at the Opera House. And when I arrived in South Africa, some people know this story, but I will tell it again, and those who've heard it before, just be a little patient, especially Mr. Loring Miller here with Rotary International, because he was responsible in having uh, gotten all of the visas for the South African students that went through schools, high schools, 15 different high schools here in the Des Moines area last year. When I arrived in South Africa at the airport in Cape Town, I walked into the terminal, there were 85 students, black students, singing. And I thought, boy, that is amazing. What a, a welcoming they give for all of the passengers. You get off of the airplane, you walk in the terminal, and there's a choir greeting you there. And of course, they were singing in Kosa, and I did not understand, but I thought I recognized my name. And they were saying, and someone came and explained it to me, they were saying, Simon Estes, welcome home. We love you. And it was so moving to me, for the first time in my life, I really felt 
that I was truly American and African. Even though I was positive that my roots were originally from Africa, when they said that to me, and they sang that to me, and they welcomed me that way, I cannot tell you how moving that was to me as an African American. And having been so touched, I remember I went to rehearsals at the Opera House in Cape Town, and I asked someone, where do those students come from? They said, we're Kailicha, which is a suburb of Cape Town. I said, I'd like to visit the school, and the school is called the Masili School. So I went there, and I saw a school that was in terrible, terrible condition. There were over 4,000 students in the high school with 60 teachers who were not all qualified, but their hearts were in the right places. And I was so moved, and the choir sang for me there again, and I wanted to help them. And I first asked them, you know, I didn't see they didn't have a piano there. I said, but don't you have a piano? They said, no. They didn't even have a pitch pipe in the school, not even a tuning fork. And um, that same day I went out and I bought them a piano because I thought they should have a piano in the school, not only for the choral purposes, but for students who want to play the piano. I said, and so those, if you find some students who are really interested in taking piano lessons, we have a piano, and I explained to them how they had to care for it, etc., because they had not had a piano there before. Those students sang for me that day, again, in the school. I must tell you, I never heard such a sound from young people in my life of a high school age. And those of you who perhaps had the, the privilege of having heard the choir when they were here last year know what I'm talking about. They have incredible voices, and voices from high school students that I've never heard anywhere in the world. And so I was there, and it was a very moving experience because all of those years of apartheid, not only could people of color, black people, they could not go to the opera house, even if they were there during the day as custodians, jan janitors, etc. Before the sun went down, as you know, they had to leave because all the people of color and black people, when the sun went down, they had to go back to the townships. So they had to be out of the city. That meant that there had never been a black person on the stage in South Africa before. When I first went there, I sang. I've, I've been back there, I think, three times in Cape Town and two times in Durban. I sang the title role of Nabucco, the title role of Porgy. I did an orchestra date in Cape Town, as well as two performances in Durban with the symphony orchestra there. It was amazing to see what happened after apartheid. I know I'm supposed to talk about an African-American in South Africa breaking barriers. I will get to that. But I want to tell you a little bit more about this story, which is fascinating. The media, as we know, they love sensational things, but things that are not always, I think, contributing to the betterment of mankind. Most people are totally unaware that after Nelson Mandela became president, there was not one single white person killed out of revenge or out of bitterness. And the media never picked up on that. And I asked the people, because I had not read about it. You know, as, as you know, I live a lot in Europe. And that fascinated me. When I went there, I thought, I didn't remember having heard of this great uprising. It never happened. The reason it didn't happen, needless to say, I've met many of the uh, African officials there, including, including Desmond Tutu, and I've sung many times for Desmond Tutu, not only at the University of Iowa, but in his church when he was still archbishop there in Cape Town. I talked to these people, and I said, did this really ever happen? They said, not once. Now, it doesn't mean that certain white people were not killed, like black people were killed, that there was a robbery or whatever. But out of a revenge, it never happened. And it did not happen because Nelson Mandela was a man, and I saw Robin Island, where he'd been incarcerated unjustly for 27 years. He came out. He never once spoke of revenge or any bitterness or hatred. I mean, he's the most remarkable human being that I think I have ever met in my life. He only talked about how South Africa could improve with people working together of all colors. And I really think that's one of the reasons there was not this backlash. But one of the other reasons is that the people in South Africa, I spoke with people of different colors. You know, they have what they call the white, the coloreds, and the blacks. I spoke with different people from all these groups. 
And it's amazing. White people, a number of white people had said to me, you know, we wanted to speak out, but we were afraid for our lives. Perhaps we were cowards, but we had children, we had family, etc., etc. So some people did not speak out, but they said they wanted to. But it was fascinating in the Opera House to see, even though the, the director of the Opera House was still a white man, he brought in people of color and people who were black and you didn't feel any tension. I mean, it's almost like an unbelievable story. I think for hundreds of years it had apartheid. And the moment a man got into position who spoke about love and forgiveness, the people got along magnificently. And the barriers in South Africa, most of them, as you probably know, have come down. The people who were really causing the most problems, I mean those people who were white people, they left. Many of them, as you know, they escaped because they thought there was going to be this retaliation, which never did take place. And so you have a group of people there who are working so magnificently together. There are tremendous problems, economic problems in South Africa, because needless to say, you cannot eradicate in seven years what's been going on for hundreds of years. So there's a lot of progress that needs to be done. But I must say that the people are working cooperatively together in South Africa. And so much of this is coming about through the arts and through music. Now, they do have financial problems. So obviously, as usual, who suffers? Arts and music always suffer when a budget is being cut. But nonetheless, the people are working towards increasing their goals of getting more contributions to the arts and music. There was a student, two students that I brought over from South Africa about nine years ago, ten years ago, Bongani Temba and Linda. Somebody told me about him in South Africa when I was in Zurich, Switzerland, and said, this young man has a great tenor voice. So to make a long story short, we got the money. He flew from um, Cape Town to Zurich, and I listened to him. I arranged for him to go to Juilliard School of Music, and his wife, Bongani, could have stayed in the United States, he got his master's degree, a black South African, more or less straight from the bush. But he got practically all A's and B's at Juilliard School of Music. Many universities would have offered him jobs here in the United States, but he said he wanted to go back to South Africa and help his country. Not only has he gone back, but Bongani is now the CEO of the Durban Natal Philharmonic Orchestra in Zululand. And he has engaged me two times to come back there and sing. So see, you never know. You should always be good to students, because you never know they might hire you someday. But uh, Bongani is doing a magnificent job there. And his wife is also singing there. I brought over also two other students who are at Juilliard, Motsuabi, Abel Motsuwadi, who's doing a fantastic job. I think Motsu uh, Abel and, and another fellow by the name of Tommy. They have magnificent voices, perhaps two of the finest voices in Juilliard School of Music, because they've had an opportunity to develop their talents. The choir that, as I've said before, that I heard in South Africa that were here from the Simon Estes Music High School, I've never, as I said before, heard voices like that anywhere in the world. They have the most powerful voices, but you know what else they have? They have incredible hearts and minds that they want to learn. <coughs> There were some of the students that were here that did extremely well academically, as Mr. Miller knows here from Rotary International. They did extremely well because they, have an op they had an opportunity to develop their minds. And I've spoken to a number of university or colleges here, and we're going to have 11 of them. I don't know if you know this yet, Lorraine, but 11 of them are going to come back. They've been accepted in colleges who were here. Because they came to Iowa, they learned incredible study skills. And the other students who were left behind in the school because we couldn't bring all of them over here, they've had 12 months to prepare for these special exams they have to take in order to get into college. Well, the students that were here in Iowa, they went back, and in four weeks they studied very hard, and all of them passed the exams except one. And the principal of the school said that is because they learned great study habits when they were here in Iowa at the 15 different public and private schools that they went to in the Des Moines, Iowa area. I mention this because there are so many barriers that need to be broken down, not only in South Africa, but many places in the world. And I still feel the best 
place for these to be broken down are in educational institutions, universities, high schools, elementary schools. In South Africa, the barriers are gone, but the scars are still there with the people because of the oppression that the majority of the people lived under for so many years. Obviously, you don't find people of color in the orchestras yet, except a few who've come from the United States. And they've had some African-American conductors there. Willie Waters has conducted when I sang in South Africa, who is now the first general and music director of any opera house in the United States. Willie Waters with the Connecticut Opera now has that position. I mention that because, as we know, this has been a big problem in the classical arts with African-American performers. We Many times they ask me in interviews about this question, why are there not more people of color conducting, etc.? And so I turned the question around because they say, uh, Simon, what do you think about it? I said, well, you name me how many people we have of color who are in administrative positions within our opera companies, our orchestras, how many stage directors, how many ballet people do we have, how many critics, how many managers, conductors, etc. And it's almost zero. So in South Africa, they have that problem there, but not for the same reason that we have it here. I think there's another reason why we do not have more African-American people in these positions. But in South Africa, the people have only been had a chance in the last seven years to start playing the violin or the piano or to study voice from a, a, a technical and a classical point of view. But I think they are really going to overcome this. The people who attended the opera performances that I performed, naturally, probably 95% of them were people uh, that were white because the, the black people, they don't have the money. They, and they live out in the townships. Therefore, they don't have the means of the transportation to come in. But this is something that we're working on in South Africa right now. So they will be able to come in and attend performances and develop their talents. They were very thrilled, needless to say, and I say this with humility and gratitude, that I had come there as a black man to sing because they had never seen a black man sing a title role before in a Verdi opera like Nabucco and in Italian. But what is fascinating, Kosa is a language that has vowel sounds very similar to Italian. And I found it fascinating when I was there because they did other operas other than just in Italian. These people, the, the choir now in South Africa, Cape Town at the Opera House, is probably maybe 60, 65 percent black. And they're singing in German, Italian, and French, as well as English and Kosa, which shows again that the mind is capable of doing anything if it gets an opportunity to be, to be developed. And that's why apartheid was such an evil, evil system, because it denied people the opportunities to develop their minds and to use their talents, not only through music, but in all other areas of their society. So there were tremendous barriers that existed in South Africa, economic barriers that are still there, but the people are trying to, to improve. It's a country that is a promising country. I mean, topographically and geographically speaking, it's extraordinarily beautiful. Cape Town is one of the most beautiful cities in the entire world. I've more or less been all around the world, and I compare. There are three cities. I mean, the other cities are beautiful, but I think of Cape Town, I think of San Francisco, and I think of Perth, Australia. These are three cities that are incredibly beautiful. Okay, if you want to say the most beautiful city in the world, you go to Paris, and they'll all tell you that Paris is the most beautiful city in the world, which it is. It's a beautiful city. But these cities have geography and topography that, that is unbelievably beautiful that you would have to go there and see someday. But I think South Africa, in that these man-made barriers and economic barriers have now really been broken down, that you're going to see that country over a period of time really excel. And I think we're going to bring a lot of students over here to the United States, and I certainly hope even here to Iowa State University in the School of Music, that I have voices that are really unbelievable. In fact, Sue asked me a question, which I said I maybe would not talk too much about now, but I will anyhow. She said, what do you, why do you think they have these voices, Simon? In having lived in Europe and traveled around the world for, since 1964, obviously I've been in Scandinavian countries, 
Mediterranean countries, African countries, mm -hmm. Russia, China, etc., etc. I have noticed that from a vocal point of view, there are certain characteristics, I think Don Simonson back here would say too, you, there is a Scandinavian sound. If you think of Birgit Nielsen and people like that, there is a, a Mediterranean sound of the Italians and the Spanish people. There is, in quotes, a black sound that does exist. And, and Sue was asking me, why do you think that is, Simon? And I can tell you, I don't, I have not studied this scientifically or medically speaking. We do know that, for example, that certain people have certain gifts, not meaning that they're superior, but certain gifts. For example, as some of you may know, if there are any doctors here, any medical doctors here? No medical doctors? Great, and they can't dispute what I'm going to say. <laughs> no, I've read reports, for example, that black people, for example, we can't float as easily as white people. And I myself, I can really, really swim, but if I try to float, I sink. It has something to do with the density of the bones. I don't know as a physicist if you've ever been involved in that. But uh, I, I read that and I've heard about that. I mention that because they have s said that sometimes the structure of people's faces lend themselves to producing certain sounds. Now you cannot generalize and say everybody that has a certain anatomical structure of the physiognomy of, the, of their face that they're going to be a great singer. You cannot say that. But it's been very fascinating because there are certain sounds. I can listen many, many times, and I can tell you if it's an Italian singer or a Spanish singer, because they, they sound very similar, the Italians and the Spanish. I can tell you if I hear a black person singing. Most of the time I can say, oh, that is a black singer. I can hear another singer, and I can tell you that is German or Scandinavian because of my ears having traveled around the world and heard these people. They're, now, sometimes people say it has something to do with diet. Some say climate. Some say geography, etc. I must say, I really don't know, but it does exist. And I think this is something that we have to accept. It doesn't mean that the Italians are better than the Scandinavian people. It doesn't mean the blacks are better than white people. It doesn't mean that the white people are better than the blacks. It's just that certain people have certain gifts. And so these, I mention that because in South Africa, now I've heard black choirs, black choruses here in the United States, I've heard white courses in the United States and all around the world, and I heard the black courses in South Africa. I have never heard voices like that in high school kids in my life. The sound they produce, you can take 40 of those kids, and I've sung with other choirs someplace in Europe where they had 150 adults and they didn't make the same amount of sound. I do not know why that is yet, but it does exist. You keep, are you from? Where are you from? Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm from North Carolina, but I sing sometimes in South Africa. Did you read, because I saw you shake it, did you, you've experienced that, didn't you? The sound, yeah. Yeah, the sound, it's, it's, I, it's unbelievable. And um, Abel Motsuati, this student who's at Juilliard, he studied with my teacher in New York um, about two years ago. He was in the studio and I went in there and my teacher wanted me to listen to Abel. And this guy started singing, he blew me out of the room. And of course, immediately I told Mr. Kellis, he said, Simon, could you get him some work? I said, well, I'll get him work, but not singing on the same stage when I'm singing, you know. <laughs> I'm not that stupid, you know. The guy had a sound that was unbelievable. Now again, I said, I don't know why, but it is incredible. And I think all of you people in the voice departments, if you heard these kids sing, it's a sound that's incredible. There's a girl who sang a solo, uh, I brought the choir to Switzerland Christmas time. They were on television with me, et cetera, et cetera, and Swiss Air paid their tickets to fly from Cape Town to be on television. There was one girl that I had not heard sing here before, Lorraine, and she sang, there's a, a song they have called The Lord is My Shepherd. It's a choral song, but she has a solo. She produced chest sounds that nobody ever told her how to produce those. She was just singing naturally that were stronger than probably almost any operatic singer I've ever heard. You all know the great sounds that Marilyn Horn used to produce in that chest sound, you know. This girl was 16 years of age and she had that sound. So I'm saying that now that we have these barriers broken down, we're going to see talents coming out of South Africa that are going to go all around the world. And I think one of their greatest assets is going to come from music and it's going to come from singers. 
because these voices have been oppressed or hidden or whatever for the last two to three hundred years and now that those barriers are down they're going to be able to be exposed. I as an American having been in South Africa, Af South Africa a number of times, in fact I was just there this past January I sang in Durban, I sang with the orchestra there and did operatic arias and duets. Uh, it was so wonderful to be there again and to see again how the people get along there. Someone asked me who was from France who was with me and was, was not a person of, of color. I asked that person, I said, do, do you, how does it feel to you to be walking around as a white person and you're in the minority? And she said something very interesting. She said, you know, actually I don't feel anything. She said, there's something very friendly about the people here. And there's something that I experience in South Africa. There's a friendliness there that I don't know that I've recognized in other parts of the world. And something that's very natural, really natural, like back to nature. And she was totally unaware, she said, because it was fascinating, because if I'm in Iowa, for example, and I'm walking around, I mean, I don't see that many people of color, needless to say. And you can go to some cities in the state of Iowa, and there are no people of color there. And so sure, if I'm walking, I'm not consciously thinking, oh, I'm the only black here. But you are aware of it somewhat. But she said she didn't feel that. And I said, explain it to me. She said, you know why? And she was French, of course, but she said, I feel the people here are natural. And so if you're natural, you don't think about color. You don't think about nationality or even maybe religion. You just say, I'm one of God's children. I'm just a human being. And I think that's because of something that has gone on in that country for so many years where they themselves were participants in oppressing people that even the oppressor, once he or she was no longer to oppress someone, this like just left them. Like it left their minds, their bodies, their hearts. It doesn't mean that everybody loves everybody in South Africa. I wouldn't go so far as to say that. But to see the progress that has been made has been fascinating. So I, as an American, who, yes, was a, a victim of discrimination, especially in my younger years in this country, yes, even in this great state of Iowa, going over to South Africa where a, a regime had just ended and seen what progress can be done and how fast it can be done was fascinating to me. And I must say it was one of, it has been, I will go back there again, of course, one of the greatest experiences of my life as an American to go there and see what has happened since apartheid is gone. And that's why people all over the world, no matter what country you may live in, if you are oppressed, it has a tendency to not let you develop your mind. And I'm sure you've all seen that quote in the United States on television, a mind is a terrible thing to waste. And I've often thought in South Africa the, the, the progress that they could have had if they had not oppressed people. I think of voices that could have been heard all over the world of probably hundreds of Abels and Bonganis and Lindas in South Africa that have gone on and died and never had a chance to be heard. Great minds. There's a young lady who went to Cambridge from South Africa, from this same area where I, from Kailicha. These people really, I'm not exaggerating, it's like coming straight from the bush. She went to Cambridge and she got all top marks. Why? Because she had the desire and the determination. It's the same thing with those children that came here to Iowa. They wanted to learn. And what was fascinating, I spoke with some other people with Rotary who said, and Mr. Miller knows this far better than I do, there's a gentleman with the Rotary International who said to me, Simon, I have a feeling if we sent 40 American kids, high school kids, someplace else in the world, I wonder if they would all have lasted for one full academic year and nobody got sent home. We didn't have to send anybody home. There were some problems sometimes within host families, you know, there were some personality problems, but there were no big major problems that, so therefore none of the children had to be sent home. And I want to tell you, of course, they all want to come back here and go to school in Iowa. 
and we're doing as much as we can to get as many of them back as we possibly can. William Penn College has accepted, uh, I believe it's six, uh, Central, uh, Buena Vista up here, they're wanting to take some students, and I'm very happy because these kids deserve a chance, and there's no better place to get an education, I think, than in Iowa, because, you know, we are still number one in the literacy as far as I know, so I think it is a great, great place for them to come and go. But I just wanted to let you know something about South Africa and the students and the music because once again it was this musical bridge that brought these students here. It was music when I stepped off the airplane that went into my ears. It was a beautiful choral sound that I heard. And so we have music as bridges can you imagine that great bridge that was built all the way across the ocean to South Africa? And it was a musical bridge that brought those kids here. It was music that let me go to South Africa. And that's why we have an important contribution in the world today. Music is perhaps one of the greatest peacemakers that has ever existed. Obviously, it's a better peacemaker than politicians. But if we think what music has done throughout history, little David, play on your harp and soothe King Solomon. I think when I first went to Europe, when I used to go to Berlin and go through point, uh, Ch Checkpoint Charlie, and the Berlin Wall was there, but music allowed me to go through the wall. When I went to Moscow in 1966, it was music that let me go to Russia. It was music that brought Russians to the United States in spite of the problems that we're having with the governments. But music is something that is one of the greatest vitamins that any of us can have in our lives. And that's why I say so often music must become more important in the United States again. We have to have music appreciation courses back into the high schools and elementary schools so that young people can learn the works of the great masters of Bach, Brahms, Beethoven, etc. Because this is a music that touches the soul and the spirit and the heart. Whereas the hard rock and the rap and this type that they call music, which I don't really call music, it's what I call superficial and temporary because it might be on the top 10 list for a few weeks and then it fades away and it's gone. But I tell you, as long as mankind is here and this planet is here, Beethoven will always be played and so will Brahms and Bach and Verdi and Puccini and Mozart and Bernstein and Copland. No, really, because this is great music it touches the soul as well as the mind. And if music doesn't touch the heart, then I find it to be something more technological, but it must touch the heart because that's why we've had music from the beginning of time. Even if some of the music was in the form of a drum or different drums producing different pitches, it was still music. And music has always been a communicator. Even in this country with the American Indian, music, even though it was in the form of drums, was a way of warning if we had danger. But again, it was music and it was rhythm. And therefore, these are ingredients that we need to keep, that we need to make sure that our young people know about this. Because you'll never know but maybe one of your children someday might also go to Africa and might participate in something in Africa, but it could be done through music. And then all of the barriers can come down. I hope that the day will come right here in the United States where we will not have barriers of color that do still exist, that still prevent people from sharing their talents and their gifts with people. I think it's a great tragedy that think that so many great voices are not being appreciated because of skin color, because of nationality, because of religious differences. As I always say, we are all God's children. 
all of us are God's children. And we have to remember that if, we have, if I have the same blood type that you have, I can save your life or you can save my life. Why? Because we are all made the same way. The basic ingredients are all the same. As, it sounds, as a song says in South Pacific, children have to be carefully taught to hate. And that exists. Remember that song in South Pacific? They have to be carefully taught to hate. And sure, the children in South Africa for hundreds of years were taught to hate. But you know, the moment the barrier was down, as I say again, I've never seen something like this in my lifetime happen what happened in South Africa. You do not experience, you do not experience at all this hatred that existed for so many years. So I think the greatest barrier, even though I was an American going there, the topic was breaking barriers or the barriers of an African American South Africa, the greatest barrier that is gone was the wall of hate, the barrier of hate. And it's basically gone. And so um, I will allow you now to ask some questions either about South Africa or my experiences or other topics that you'd like to ask uh, questions about that are related to music or uh, human behavior, international behavior, politics, whatever you want to talk about, we'll just, the floor is open. Yes. Yeah, um, I'm inquired here at uh, ISU, and uh, well, I was, uh, I was wondering, uh, see, my favorite band here at, or that I listen to a lot is the Dave Matthews Band, and uh, I just was, uh, I don't know all about apartheid and, apartheid and everything like that, but I was just wondering if you were familiar with uh, the Dave Matthews Band and if uh, people like uh, in South Africa, like, uh, hear that, because um, couple of their songs uh, talk about the, you know, things that went on in South Africa. He's from uh, Johannesburg, South Africa, and uh, I just read a little like documentary about, you know, Dave Matthews Band and, and what um, what that, you know, was about, and I we listened to the lyrics, like, uh, it just kind of touched me, like you said, you know, because I really, uh, I'm in choir here, I love to sing, I like to uh, sing um, Dave Matthews like every day, and uh, I just really like kind of touched me, like uh, how he talked about it and stuff like that, and I was just kind of uh, wondering if you were uh, with, uh, with that band, um, and when you were talking about uh, like uh, like the color barriers being break, broken and stuff like that, like I think that he does a good job with that because like his band is like the majority of their of his band is like you know African American. There's like three African Americans and then like um, there's like two whites. And uh, I was just they're my favorite band. And I just was you know he's from South Africa, so I was just trying to touch on that. And I was just kind of I had to ask you if you were familiar with Dave Matthews because. Uh, you know, he, he just really touches me to sing, and you know, I'm choir, but he just really touches me to sing and, and get what you know what I'm trying to say out. I'm sorry to say I don't know him, but I'm happy that there's been this rapport that that has taken place. And uh, you say he's more or less in jazz, right? Yeah, it's sort of like rock, like jazz. You know? I think jazz music, incidentally, is great music. When I was a kid at the University of Iowa, I mean, I loved Dave Brubeck and Duke Ellington and Errol Garner. But again, you see, this, is, this was great music to me. I mean, the, some popular music is great. I mean, some of the great songs that Perry Como, you were too young, but Nat King Cole, <laughs> what they used to sing, this was great music. And, uh, but I think that, that jazz, and it is, jazz is performed in South Africa. But what is fascinating is to see them sing some of their own traditional music and to see how they dance with the music. That is very, very fascinating. I would like to, yes. Talk about, uh, or just, you know, listen to the lyrics. Because um, I read a book about Dave Matthews Band, and it talks about apartheid and what happened in South Africa. And mm. It, it kind of opened me up because I had never heard anything about it. And just listening to the music, you know, it just, it, you know, led me to discover more about it. I'll have to make sure I get to hear him sometime, yes. Yes, please. Thank you. 
description of that in terms of certain kinds of sounds you were talking about? Mm -hmm. In South Africa, they had a sound. Well, I'm thinking of culture and opportunity to produce a certain sound. If you took that person into another culture, just like language, they might take on a different voice. You see, we are, we get 50% of our chromosomes from our mother and 50% from our father. That means by nature we've already been endowed with this, this makeup. Certainly when I spoke of diet, geography, anatomy, that's all part of the culture. But I think if you, a talent is something that is given, let's say when a person is conceived and born. I mean, no matter, I could have had the greatest coach in the world, I could never run 100 meters in 10 seconds flat. Could never do it. I mention that because we can have training, but there are certain physiological limits that we have. I do not associate that with the mind, though. The mind is something different. As we all know, we use such a small percentage of our capacity but I think in terms of what I will call a physical talent, which is singing, and if you say running or jumping or whatever, these are physical talents. And the reason I think that it could be partially cultural, but not all, for example, I think, I don't want to use myself, but let's say if Luciano Pavarotti, you all know who he is or was, is, excuse me, I guess he's still alive. So sorry, Luciano. Um, <laughs> If Luciano Pavarotti had been born in China, and if he'd had an opportunity to sing, he would have still had that voice. Because I think the voice was there at birth. It's the same way that if someone does not have the basic natural ingredients to become an opera singer, I think that they can have the greatest teacher in the world. But if the basic talent is not there, they probably cannot sing opera. And so I mention that because I know what you mean by culture, and I do think, as I said, I don't have an answer because I've not done a study about this. I have found it very fascinating to recognize that in certain parts of the world, that certain people have certain sounds. I will tell you something. In the oriental part of the world, I have noticed that people from Korea have incredible voices. Hey, I see you shaking your head. Have you noticed that too, Bob? It's amazing. Now, I went to Juilliard with a student, Katsuo Miniwa, I remember. He was a baritone. He later became a tenor. He had a fairly good voice. And I've heard other people from Oriental countries, but I do not know why the people from Korea have these incredible voices. And Juilliard School of Music has a lot of them there. And so this is why I, I don't know if it has to do with it's like diet, culture, anatomy, language, maybe all of these things. But I do recognize certain voices that are attributed to certain people. Don, have you ever thought of that before? Uh, Yeah, I don't think so either. Um, but I think we certainly hear um, preferences, cultural preferences, for specific tone qualities. There's a very clearly defined French classical tone quality yes. as opposed to English, as opposed to Italian, as opposed to Scandinavian or, or uh, German. And those are very, very clear to someone who sings opera. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to say something um, that I, I don't think the person, because I won't mention this person's name, it happens to be a doctor in New York City that came from Israel and attended the University of Iowa as a student and later became a speech pathologist who later got a PhD and is now in New York City right now. 
I won't mention this person's name because this doctor, and I won't even mention the gender, but this doctor has been doing a study in New York City of looking at hundreds, in fact this person said by now thousands of vocal cords or folds, whatever we want to call them, and this doctor said to me that this doctor has noticed a difference in the folds between people of color and people of not, of, you know, black people versus white people. And said something very fascinating, and I, what I will do, and I hope none of you think that I'm not being fair to you, but uh, this person did not want to make this statement yet because the study is still going on because people might consider this person to be strange, but the person was not black at all, but said it was noticeable. And um, just to let all of you know so you don't think I'm a kook or something, I will discuss this privately sometime with you, Don, because he's a, he's, a, he's a teacher here, and I know I can trust him. He's a tenor. <laughs> but uh, it's fascinating, you know, uh, how certain people have certain gifts, you know. And, I, and again, I'm talking about physiological, anatomical uh, gifts and not gifts related to the mind. Yes. And that is the absence of a written tradition in most black South African cultures. So they learn to listen at a very young age. And they, I mean, it's oral learning really predominates. Mm -hmm. so most of the Nguni languages do not even have their own scripts. Mm -hmm. written in the Latin script. And it also shows up in the fact that um, your average black South African, particularly the ones who live in the larger cities like Johannesburg, are comfortably fluent in five languages. Mm -hmm. in the, and this is achieved in the absence of a lot of what we would consider formal schooling. So it's like learning five languages 